All right, let's do this. So, so just a reminder that your lab demo two is due next week in lab. Just in case that fell off your radar, we had a few students for demo one who come up claim they completely forgot about it. Well, you know, oh well. Uh, but demo two, uh, I posted the link up here. It's the same description as in lab activity four. Uh, just cut and paste in a new document. But I added though are the rubrics, just like I did last time before the demo. I added the rubrics in there, so you know exactly what the TAs are looking for. The TAs have the same exact rubrics that you have in this document. I don't share anything special with them uh, in regards to grading or rubrics. So you can see exactly how they're going to be grading. It. You have the exact same information that they have while they're grading your demo. So take a look at that, and just remember, it's your responsibility to demo everything to the TAs and to know what all the requirements are. Read the rubrics, read the document, know exactly what you're demoing, and when you demo to the TA, they're just gonna say, okay, show me your stuff, and, and you'll have to go through and make sure you hit all of the points. They're not going to remind you like, hey, it looks like you missed this feature, and then give you extra time to work on it. None of that, there was some of that in demo one. Uh, we talked about that, and that's not happening. Uh, so make sure you read through the document, know what you're responsible for, know what you're supposed to be demoing to the TA, so when they say, okay, show me what you got, you can go through all the testing, all the code, you can show them what you have and make sure you hit every point that you're supposed to have. And the big one, clicker is live. So we have the next homework out. As of right now, there's not too much you can work on, but in 50 minutes, that's going to completely change. You'll be able to do the first three objectives after today's material. <clears throat> and then uh, next week, either Monday or Wednesday, you'll have everything to finish up the primary objective. So for this homework, you are building the so WebSocket server that's going to control the clicker game. So in lab last week, you built a GUI for the clicker, and you connected to my WebSocket server, got the updates, got the information, registered your username and, and that stuff. For the homework, you're building the exact other side. You can use that GUI that you built for testing, and after 10 p.m. today, after that last lab is finished, you can share your GUIs as well. If you wanna trade GUIs, somebody has a really nice one they wanna share with the class, um, feel free to share that with your classmates and use those GUIs to be able to test your server, connect it to your, uh, your server that you're building, and be able to play your game through that GUI. So you're building that other side. The server stuff we'll talk about next time, but today we're gonna to talk about the big topic. Uh, one of the big topics is how do we test these actors, which is what you, you have to test actors for this, uh, for this homework, of course. So with that in mind, let's learn about testing actors. The lecture question today, I know it looks like a lot of text, but this one, I mean, I could say it in a, a few sentences. Uh, but I want to make sure I get everything clearly defined in this, on this slide, so that ended up being a lot of words. But you're writing an actor that's going to control a bank account. You can make with, uh, deposits, withdrawals, and check the balance. These are the three features that it has. And it ha has these features as an actor, set up as an actor, and send messages. Send a deposit message, a withdrawal message, and a check balance message. When you send a check balance, it sends a, a balance message back. So it's not too much more complex than Monday's lecture question. You have an actor class that tracks a single integer value and responds to the messages and changes that value or sends that value based on information uh, that it's given. So the only real functionality difference is uh, it doesn't take a, a parameter, an initial value in the constructor, and there were no withdrawals on Monday. So not too different than Monday's question. The big, of course, the big, big, big change and the reason why it's due Sunday and not tonight uh, which I don't mean to talk about that much, it's not too crazy, but, uh, but is testing this actor. How do we test this? Uh, this is a 20 pointer, you have to write your code and your test cases, and uh, same thing with the homework objectives. I have my incorrect and correct solutions on the server, and your tests have to distinguish between them and get this functionality. So how do we test actors is our big question, but before we get into that, we have a little side topic that I, I kind of uh, tried to avoid a little bit. I don't know why, it's not that crazy of a topic, I just did want to add one more thing uh, to your plate. But we will have to cover it here, because we'll need it for testing actors. Uh, and I, I just don't want you to be completely blind to what is this new syntax and stuff. So let's talk about traits. 
and mixings. So let me set up the scenario. I have an object, a, a class that I'm writing. I'm extending some other class. And I'm in a situation where I say, you know what I want to do here is extend two classes. I've got two classes or two abstract classes or a combination thereof. And I want to extend both of them. So say I have some class. I want it to act as an actor, be able to run concurrently, respond to actor messages. But I also want it to be a physical object that's going to work in a physics engine. So I give a reference of this type to the physics engine, have the physics engine do its thing as well. So I want a class that extends both of these. What do I do? Well, I just, I don't. That's just not allowed. We can't do this. Not allowed. So we get around this. Uh, yeah, question? Is it true that you can't store variables in traits? Not in Scala. So, so in Java, traits are kind of like Java interfaces in the sense that we can have multiple inheritance with them. But traits, actually, now, now that you ask it, I'll say I'm about 90% sure, so don't, don't take this as absolute fact. But I'm almost certain traits can have. Oh, I'm down myself the more, more I answer that. Let me, let me put a pin in that one. Right, sorry. Uh, I was under the impression that they do, but now that I'm thinking about it, I, I don't know if they, I don't think they do. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll table that one. I, I won't give you a definitive answer on that. They can have methods, though. That one I do know, because that's what we use them for. Um, but, but I haven't seen a trait that we use for variables, so I'm not, I'm not so sure. Um, so if we want multiple inheritances, what we do to get around this, and in my opinion is better design anyway, is we would have one actor class, and I highly recommend this for your clicker game. We have one actor class that basically acts as a controller and handles the actor messages that it's receiving. And then as an instance variable, stores an instance of whatever object it's, uh, it's representing. So, for example, for clicker, have one clicker actor that, you're, uh, that you have to write as part of the definition in the description. And then in that actor class, create a, an instance of a, another class that you write, a game class, that is unaware of the actor system at all. It has its own API that you just translate actor messages into calls of that API. And then, act as, and then think of the actor as the controller, and then the game class as the model, and separate the uh, the translation of those inputs from the actual game itself. Uh, so in that way, we had an object that can have these two different behaviors, these, be these two different classes, but without the need for multiple inheritance. If we were using multiple inheritance in that way, we should probably start thinking that that is two separate classes with two separate concerns and organize our code. It's usually better to have those as two separate classes. So that's how we get around this. and. You know, one of the reasons it's not allowed is because that is a mess, and uh, more importantly, it causes a mess for the compiler. The compiler has a lot of questions that it needs answered, and with multiple inheritance, it just uh, can't sort things out very well. <clears throat> so this is our issue, but there are times where we do want this uh, just to simplify our lives, and this is where we use something called traits. So this is similar to an abstract class, but it cannot have a constructor, and it may or may not be able to have variables. Let's see if chat has an answer for me there. Okay. Uh, all right, so, but it cannot have a constructor. This one I know for sure. Traits cannot have constructors. Not allowed, just not allowed. What we gain with traits is there's no limit to the number of traits we can inherit in a single class. We can have a class that inherits 100 traits if we want. That's absolutely perfectly fine. And we can get the behavior from all of those traits. So in the, the handout code, we have one trait defined database. This could be an abstract class. If I wasn't covering traits today, I would have just made this an abstract class, and uh, there wouldn't have been any difference in the behavior of the homework. But since we're covering traits, I decided to use this, the, the keyword trait for a database. So all I'm doing is defining four methods that anyone who extends this trait has to implement. Now, if I want multiple inheritance, I use what's called mixins, which has a little bit different syntax than the inheritance we saw, uh, but not too different here. And we say with mixins, the terminology, these traits are mixed into a class. So we can extend the class, and we can only extend one 
class or abstract class or tree, we can only extend one and then we mix in additional traits using the with keyword. So we're saying this class that I want to be an actor and a database for some reason, which I would just have this as two separate classes in this case, uh, it's going to extend the actor class with database as a mix-in, that database trait as a mix-in. So now I'm extending two different things, a, an abstract class and a trait in this case. And then I'm responsible for implementing all of the abstract methods in anything that I extend or mix in, anything that's inherited, I have to implement all of the methods. And now this class, if I instantiate this, it can be used as an actor, so it can handle messages, it can be added to an actor system with props, and it can also be used as a database. Anything can, has that guarantee, any other code has that guarantee that it's going to have those four database methods implemented, so it can use this as a database as well. I feel like I have one more. Oh, yeah, I do have another point here. Uh, on the, the quiz, I had, had this question quite a bit, so I want to make sure this is clarified. The, on the quiz, none of the code on that quiz had errors in it. It all compiled fine. When I generated the solutions for the quiz, that was the exact code that I used. The only thing I excluded were the imports for on the quiz, just because it would take up space. You can assume all the imports are there. But I, I in IntelliJ, wrote that code, ran the code to get my solutions, cut and paste that code into, onto the quiz, and that's the exact code. It compiles, it runs. I always make sure I test my code before I put it on a quiz like that. Uh, some of the inheriting classes, when I have a class extend another class, sometimes I wasn't implementing all the methods. That's because in the abstract classes, I had equals curly braces. So I have a, a method definition in the abstract class. So the class strictly wasn't abstract because all of the methods had a definition, but the definition of all those methods was do nothing. So in the, when I extended that class, I didn't have to override every single method because I had those default definitions that just did nothing. So any method I didn't override, that method just inherited the behavior of doing nothing and just did nothing whenever that method was called. It was not a compiler error that, that was valid. Uh, uh, valid scholar, valid syntax. I'm just saying equals. If I didn't have this equals and then the curly braces and I just left it at unit and then ended, that would be an abstract method and that would have to be implemented in the, any extending class. So I just wanted to clarify that. I got that question quite a few times on Friday, uh, on Wednesday. So I just want to make sure that's clarified. All right, so we've seen actors. We have multiple actors. We can create multiple actors. We can have them running concurrently. How do we test this? This is our, our big burning question right now. For the homework, you have to test each method just like the, the other homeworks. How do we do this? So let me set up a, a scenario. Let's just try to use uh, the function suite that we've used before and do regular unit testing like we've been doing all semester. Let's just try that. So we're going to create a, uh, a function suite. In that function, sorry, uh, excuse me. In that function suite, We'll fire up our actor system, we'll create a new actor system, we'll create uh, instances of our actors, add them to the system, have them running concurrently. We'll send them a few messages, fire off these messages, uh, send a message that expects some behavior, some response back, and then we'll have our asserts to make sure we get the correct message in response. There's two huge problems with this setup. One, the actors run concurrently with your testing code. So you're almost guaranteed that you're going to reach those asserts before your actors even receive the first message. You send those messages, those messages are somewhere in your machine bouncing around trying to get to that actor, and your code immediately goes to the next line, it goes to that assert. Well, there's nothing to assert. It's probably just going to fail or whatever, uh, however your code is written. You get to the end of the, the test suite and it just fails or it just passes if you don't have uh, depending on how you have your search set up. Also, if that message you send that expects a response back from your actor, your test suite can't get that response. It's not part of the actor system. Your function suite has no, no knowledge of actors, just created the actor system, 
and how is it going to receive those responses? Uh, what, what method would we write? What do we do to receive one of those messages? So two big problems with this. We're not going to be able to, uh, we're not going to be able to, to get this to work. We can put, we, you could think, and I thought this before, last semester when I was like, how am I grading this stuff? Is have the actors have the assert methods inside of them. But since the actors are running concurrently, they're running in the system, they're far enough removed from the main test suite that those asserts don't matter. Uh, it, it, they are running on separate threads. So on this thread over here, we had an assertion that failed, but the thread, the main thread that's running our test suite never gets that message. It never gets the, the report that that test failed and that it should fail. So having the asserts in the actors doesn't work, or else we could have the asserts in the actors and have the main thread just sleep for a few seconds. Uh, we could get away with that. Um, none of these ideas are going to work, at least not great. I had some really sloppy grading code last semester to get this to work. It was awful. So what we're going to do <laughs> is pull out a library and have a library that's going to save the day. This is part of the ACA library. So the same place where we're getting the actors from, they have a, a test suite for specifically for testing actors. It's exactly made, tailor-made to solve this exact problem. And it's going to be the ACA test kit that we're going to pull in. Make sure you have these versions the same. Uh, it, the versions of these libraries have to be the same because they're made to communicate and work with each other. So make sure those versions are, are the same when you add them to your palm. Or um, when you clone the clicker code or the examples repo, both of those should have um, what's expected to be the final POM for the semester. So if you just want to grab that POM and not think about the POMs for a while, you can just grab those ones. All right, so let's set up a test suite that, uh, that uses this library. So there's a lot of new syntax, and we'll go through it here. Oh, not yet, but we'll still go through this. Uh, the good news is this is straight from the documentation for the test kit. If you want to just reuse this code, nobody's going to judge you. If you just want to reuse this one, go for it. But I do want to go step through this and talk about what's actually happening here. So first, we need to import everything. We're importing from the test kit all the classes that we're going to use. And we're also importing from Scala test. Scala test is what we've been using for the function suite. It's what we've been using all semester. This test suite that we're using, this uh, uh, that we're going to use, this test kit from ACA, it is built on top of Scala test. So it's going to use a lot of similar syntax. It's still going to work, uh, integrate with IntelliJ the same way that our, our unit tests worked. But we have uh, just new functionality added on top of our current test kit. So let's add those in. And I'll remind this again later, but this line right here, scala.concurrent.duration.underscore, import everything from that duration library from Scala. We're going to use some syntax, and we've seen it on, briefly on Monday, to be able to specify a certain time interval. And we did that by saying if we want 100 milliseconds, we would say 100 dot millis. That comes from this duration package. If you don't have that import line on there, that's going to be an error on your 100 dot millis. And IntelliJ will not figure it out. It won't say, hey, it looks like you want to import this duration package. IntelliJ will not help us out on this one. So if you have those errors on the millis, make sure you have this line here. And the worst part is, when you delete everything, if you, like uh, here I just stripped out my test suite here, IntelliJ will auto-clean that import. So as soon as you delete all of your millis in your code, it will get rid of that line automatically for you, and then when you add in your millis back, it's broken, and you're going to pull out your hair like I did, trying to figure out why that went away. Uh, so make sure this line is here so you have that, uh, that functionality. We're going to extend test kit. And in the constructor of the test kit, this has a constructor. It's not a trait. We can only extend one, this uh, one class, and we're done with our extensions. We have to use mixins after this. But in this constructor, we're going to create an actor system. So we extend the test kit 
and start an actor system all at the same time. And that actor system, the test kit is going to control that system and, uh, and, and add all the testing functionality to the system, including being a part of the system itself so that it can receive messages that, uh, that are sent back to the sender. And we have all our mix-ins. We'll use each one of these. We get, a lot of, we get certain functionality from each one of these. None of these mix-ins have any methods that we have to implement. They all just provide already implemented methods that we're going to use in our testing. So we have uh, a lot of functionality that we mix in with these. For example, this uh, before and after all trait gives us, and this is uh, the before and after all, uh, almost certain, uh, is part of Scala test. It's, oh yeah, it's right here. Is part of Scala test itself. We could have used this in our uh, in our other test suites. And a few students have. I've seen that in some of the submissions where you had uh, before each test. There's some certain code you want to use. So this we could have been using all along, but now we really it's really important that we use this now. Before and after all has a method called after all, which runs after all of our tests execute. So after every test is done, this code this method is going to be ran. The trait has its default behavior of doing nothing for this, so we're going to override that default behavior and add some functionality here. So after all of our tests run, we want to ru shut down our actors, the whole system, so everything shuts down gracefully. We don't have things floating around in memory, and uh, as we'll see next week, we don't have a server that's just orphaned and has to figure out how to shut down on its own. The operating system has to clean things up. We want things to shut down gracefully. Uh, as we'll see next week, if we don't shut down the socket server gracefully, the operating system is going to take a while to figure out that that port isn't being used anymore. So if you restart it, it's going to say port is already in use because you didn't shut it down gracefully. So we want everything to shut down gracefully, so we're going to add this after all and shut down the system. Next, we can finally start looking at our tests itself. We have different syntax for this. With our unit tests, we just gave each unit test a test name. Here we're using behavioral testing syntax, and we're testing a certain behavior. So some, something must have some certain behavior in this test. We have this kind of human readable, um, human readable syntax here. Or that should, should say ours, our tests. And this must and in, here we're, the, or the, we're uh, the, the test kit, at least the library, is taking advantage of some of Scala's syntax and doing quite a bit of, of work here to get this to be kind of human readable. I don't know if it's worth it, you can judge for yourself. But so we can get these two strings and the keyword, not keywords, but the methods must and in. So the library, the test kit, um, the, uh, sorry, the, the word spec like has a string wrapper class and then defines methods must and in and some other methods uh, that we can use and then calls these methods inline in the same way that we call the exclamation point method. We call that inline the same way we do the plus sign method for ints and, and string concatenation, things like that. So using that syntax from Scala, I'm calling these inline. And then Scala will automatically convert this string into the string wrapper class. When it sees the must, it'll know that it has to convert that to the string wrapper, call the string wrapper's must method using inline syntax, and then takes a block as its other, uh, as the other parameter. So all that just to get more human readable things. So if you're curious what is going on there, this is valid Scala. It's it's a little tricky stuff they're doing here, but it is valid Scala just to make it look like and read like a sentence in plain English. So if you if you appreciate Python, you might you'll appreciate this. It's getting more of that human readable syntax in there, uh, but there is a lot of work going under the hood to get Scala to behave like that. All right, so after all that, we're finally ready to write a test and test an app. So let's test the actor that we wrote for Monday's lecture question. We have this value actor that would receive increased messages to increase the number that was storing. And when it received the get value method, or the get value message, 
it would respond with its value in a value message. So let's test this thing and let's step through this one line at a time. First, we do stuff that we've seen. We're going seen on Monday, so a little review. We're going to start our actor, our value actor. We're going to call its constructor using props, but we're not creating the actor system. Remember that when we called the constructor of the test kit, that's when we created our actor system and named our actor system. We have access to that actor system through a system instance variable in the test kit class. It's all part of the test kit that we extended. So we're just going to access the system that we created in that constructor. So we're going to access that system, create our value actor, give it an initial value of 10, and let that run concurrently alongside our test kit. We're going to send it messages using the exclamation point method, just like we did last time. We want to send this value actor some messages, which, uh, which you weren't required to do for your, um, for your lecture question. So if history tells me anything, nobody, you know, two people did it maybe. But this time for testing, we'll, we'll start getting used to that exclamation point method. I, I did that at first. I, don't want, I didn't want to overwhelm you too much on Monday. I didn't mean to, that to sound mean or anything. So we're going to send it some messages. Send it the increased message twice. So at this point, we would expect after these two messages resolve, I would expect the value to be 20 after these messages. Just for a quick reminder of what the lecture question was. But here's where we get our big, first big problem that the test kit is going to solve for us. I can't just access that value next. I, we're going to first send the get value message, wait for a response, and then read that response to make sure it's what we expect. But we can't just send that get value message right now because we have no guarantee of the order in which those three messages will be received by the app. So we always have to be aware of this concurrency, especially when we start having multiple actors running concurrently. We have to be aware of the order of things and the fact that the order is undefined. It's non-deterministic. We don't know, we just sent two increased messages. That second one we sent might arrive at the actor before the first one. We have no guarantees, we, don't, we just don't know. It depends on so many factors that, uh, that are designed to not care. And we, we don't want them to care about that because that's how, uh, I mean, that's really what we want with concurrency is code running concurrently. We don't want these messages to be in order. So we're going to add this line, expect no message. This is part of the test kit. It's going to take a time duration. And my test kit's just going to sit here and wait for a tenth of a second right here. 100 milliseconds. Tenth of a second, it's going to sit there and do nothing. And the expect no message, I'm not expecting any responses or anything at this point. Expect no message. If a message is received in that tenth of a second, the test will fail. So I'm, I'm expecting no message. My actor isn't supposed to send a message back. It cannot send a message or else my test is going to fail. So I'm writing the behavior that I expect, and I expect no message for at least a tenth of a second. So I'm going to wait a tenth of a second and then move on to the next line. So a tenth of a second later, which is just some arbitrary value that I chose that's going to be long enough, if, if, you know, barring some, something really crazy going on, maybe some other process is chewing up all the cores and taking all the CPU time, you know, barring something really crazy like that. A tenth of a second, 100 milliseconds, is gonna be plenty of time to make sure that those two messages arrive at the actor and are processed before I move on. So now that I have a reasonable assurance that those two increased messages were received and processed by my actor, now I'm going to send that get value message. Now that I know that value, if everything's working right, I expect that value to be 20 at this point because those messages were processed. Now I'm going to send the get message. And now I'm going to sit there and wait for the response. For this, we're going to use our second new method from the test kit, uh, from the test kit class. Expect message type, which takes a type parameter of the message type that I'm expecting, similar to the way we create a list with the type parameter. This is a method that we're calling with a type parameter, which we'll get into quite a bit more when we get to level four, when we start looking at functional, a little more functional uh, fun. Uh, so we're going to give it a type parameter of the type of message we're expecting, and we're going to give it a time frame for how long it should wait for that message, the maximum amount of time that it should wait for that message. 
So this line here is read, expect a message of type value within, a uh, within one second. If anything happens that's outside of that, the test suite fails. The test fails and we know something's broken, we either gotta fix our code or you successfully failed one of my incorrect uh, solutions. So if no messages are received after a second of waiting, the test fails, it didn't get any messages that it was expecting. If it receives a message that's a type other than value, some other message type, the test is going to fail, it's expecting it to be a type value. But if we do get a, a message of type value within a second, it's going to be stored in this, uh, in this value, a value named value of type value. It's, but, uh, and then I can start asserting on it. Yeah, question. Uh, on this highlighted line? Be yeah. Because it took too long? Like, so it was, like the different like project and it's just a lot of poor things that you have to be on your shipping about the time to wait to test it and it would have gone through this. So, so you're saying if, right, so if, if my program just isn't getting enough CPU, this actor took longer than a second to process that message and send me a response. Yeah, that, that can happen. And in those cases, the test would end up failing. In, uh, so the one, one comfort I'll give you in AutoLab, you get your own dedicated machine. There's nothing else running on that except your code and my grader code. There's nothing else running. We really limit the inconsistencies in that, that sense. Uh, in, the, in the past week of my life, I spent trying to make sure there's no inconsistencies in my grader for that primary objective making sure there's no inconsistency. I had one, I was debugging it last week, not to go on too much of a tangent, but I did have a case exactly like that where my, uh, where my socket server wasn't spinning up, the uh, sockets themselves weren't connecting in time. I was waiting like two seconds and it still wasn't enough time where about 25% of my submissions were failing the primary objective, just randomly based on pure chance because I was right on that line of where sometimes it did it, sometimes it didn't. Finally figured out exactly where that was and it jacked up the time to like five seconds and now it's consistent. So absolutely that can happen, it does happen, it's frustrating every single time. Uh, in the clicker homework, it's why all the socket server stuff, all the testing for that I put in the primary objective, so at least you won't have to worry about that. At least not yet. And at this point in your career you won't have to. Uh, but yeah, absolutely. Uh, when we're working with concurrent code, just in general, when we're working with concurrent code and everything's happening at the same time, there's a lot of variance. It's better, best to increase your time here to make sure that you have enough time to, uh, to get everything resolved so we don't have any variance in the testing. But also it's a balance because you don't want it too high because then your tests start timing out or worst case you're just sitting there for a while for your tests to run. Uh, so there's a delicate balance here. With this value here, there's not too much harm in jacking that one up because if, when you do receive that message, you're not waiting the full second. So if this message, I receive it in 20 milliseconds, I don't have to wait that full second. So it's, there's no harm in increasing this one a lot. But yeah, absolutely, there's a lot to worry about in these uh, when we're testing concurrent code and really testing any timing things like this. There's, there are a lot of variables. And finally, we receive this message. Now we're back into a territory, mostly at least, there's one thing we'll see in the next slide, but at least mostly what we've seen before, we're gonna throw in our certs and just make sure everything looks the way we expect it to. There's one caveat to that. In many cases, do not access the variables in the message types. For example, for today's lecture question, do not access those ints in those message, in that message type. So when you receive that response of type uh, balance, the name of balance, I think, when you read that, don't say balance dot whatever you name that variable equals because there's, it's very unlikely that you're going to name that variable the same thing that I named that variable in my correct and incorrect solutions on the server. So make sure you're not accessing that variable directly. But recall something that we mentioned briefly on Monday, if we, how many lines did I split this up in? It slides, split this up in quite a few slides, right? Uh, but you can take advantage of something that I mentioned briefly on Monday. K 
case classes have an overridden equals method. They have an equals method implemented such that equals is going to compare the values within the message. To some ways we get from case classes. It won't compare by references like other objects would. So instead of accessing the variable, instead of saying value dot whatever I named that integer var variable, say does value equal a new instance of variable of the expected value and then the equality that double equal will call the dot equals method and then check compare those values stored inside the message, inside this instance of a case class, of two case classes. So make sure you're doing that, especially for today's lecture question, uh, be, or otherwise you're just guessing what those variables are named. For the clicker homework, you don't have to worry about that since we do define all the message types. They're in the starter code. There's a, a Scala file with all of the message types that we'll use. We're all using the same message types. We're all using the same variable names. So that is defined so you can access, uh, for example, the game state in the game state message parse the JSON and everything, we really have to access that. Uh, so you can access that in, uh, in Clicker, but for the lecture question, I left those undefined and there's no starter code. So make sure you're comparing those case objects with a new case, uh, case class. All right, are there any questions on testing actors right now? Probably not. It's, it's one of those things, just like most things in programming, you really got to get your hands on before you have questions, uh, before you're asking about it. So. Uh, so definitely see us all in office hours and stuff. All right, let's talk about databases. We got one more topic here, and let's start looking at this picture that we're going to stare at for the next couple of weeks. Let's talk about the architecture that we're going to use for our programmers. In, uh, in a lot of the rest of the semester, including Clicker, including the last homework, including your project. We're going to use this type of architecture, and we're going to learn about all the pieces of this uh, today and next week, and we already have the actor messages piece. So we have two different front ends for the project and for Clicker, either a web front end or a desktop front end. Both of those are going to communicate over the internet you, uh, or using localhost, I mean not technically the internet, but over a network, using network protocols, using WebSockets to connect to a WebSocket server, which is part of our Scala programs. That socket server is going to maintain an actor system and communicate with actor messages, and the system can have a lot of actors in it, of course, to be able to control our model for our programs. And then that model is going to access a database to be able to have persistent storage. We, there's save games in Clicker. We want to be able to save people's games so they can come back some other time and resume where they were. And importantly, so we can restart the server without losing player data. We need to save that in a way that's going to persist. So we'll talk about that a bit over the next week. But for today, let's talk about this chunk. MySQL and using a database, using a SQL database. So we're going to look at MySQL and start using MySQL this semester. You've seen SQLite last semester with Python, so let's talk about the differences. So MySQL is a database server. So it, just like any other server, it's a separate program that's going to run on your machine and wait for requests. It's a separate process listening for requests using network protocols, using TCP, uh, in MySQL's case. It's going to wait for a TCP socket connection. It's going to wait for SQL commands from our Scala code, and we're going to connect to it and communicate to it that way. As opposed to SQLite, SQLite removed all the networking. It it's kind of still exists in some way, uh, but it's all abstracted away so you don't have to think about it, and it just uses file I.O. to store your information. Kept things nice and simple for 115. That's what we wanted. We just wanted the idea of databases out there. Uh, but, but now we want to talk a bit more about networking and building these, uh, these apps that span multiple processes. Let's, uh, let's move to MySQL and a proper database server. Uh, oh, and, and importantly, I want to make sure I mention this point. Uh, since this runs as a separate process and uses network protocols using TCP, 
the database can run on a separate machine. So as your apps grow and they're big enough that one machine can't run your entire app, this is where it gets useful to have MySQL running on a separate machine, communicating to it through TCP sockets, and with actors, since your actors communicate through message passing, and that can be abstracted through network protocols as well, we could have each actor or, or a few actors spread across multiple machines as well. So if we want to build our apps as a distributed app across a whole server room if we wanted, we have the right setup and the right architecture to be able to support that. Each, this actor system can be spread across many machines since we're just working through message passing anyway. Well, we can pass those messages over a network, no big deal. The database is a separate process. We could have this as a separate part of the actor system. And of course, our front end is anywhere in the world that's communicating over the internet. All right, so MySQL, you'll have to, I, I link to the documentation. I won't go through the steps because we all have different operating systems, et cetera. Uh, but go to the MySQL site, find MySQL, download, install it. Through the installation process, it's going to ask you to set up a username and password. So make sure to remember what your username and password are. And when you run MySQL, it's going to run on port three, uh, 3306, and it's going to listen for TCP connections through that. We're not, we don't have to deal with the low-level uh, TCP socket code, so we're going to use an interface we're going to use a, pull on a library and use an interface to be able to connect to MySQL. So there's this uh, JDBC MySQL driver that we're going to add to Maven. It's in the Maven file, the pom.xml files that I have spread across uh, the multiple repos. And we're going to use that to connect to MySQL. So you run MySQL, download, install, run MySQL. That's running as a separate process on your machine, listening on port 3306. Then you run your Scala program and have code that looks like this using that, the JDBC driver that you download through Maven. Boy, that's a lot of technical terms in that sense. Um, run your, your Scala program to connect to that MySQL database, and then you can start sending it SQL statements, the same SQL statements that we saw in 150. This is where you need your username and password that you use, that you set up during installation. And I gotta put this warning out there, never ever, this is always a, 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 opens up a big security hole here, never ever checking a password to version control. I have this in the sample code. Ooh, I forgot to add that to the examples repo. I'll have to do that after lecture. Um, but I'll check it into the repo. Don't, don't do that. I mean, I'm not using this password for anything. It's clearly a fake password. That I, set up, uh, that I wasn't actually using for my MySQL, but just to give you an example of what the password is. Uh, be careful if you have passwords in code like this. One, try to just not do it. I, I'm talking in your professional careers and everything, when you get out there in the world, you have access to databases with uh, sensitive information. You have to protect that password. That password gets out, people have access to that, that database. MySQL is made to connect over networks, so somebody anywhere on the planet with an internet connection, they have that username and password and your URL, they have access to your database, unless you have some restrictions set up in the database to disallow that, you know, it, it, there's a lot to it. But secure that password if you're checking into, say, a public repo, that's a big, no, no, don't, don't do that. Even a private repo, that means everybody on the team has the password now, it's not necessarily what you want. There are ways to get around that. We. Uh, we don't really have to talk about it too much here because I want to get through these slides. But once we are connected, now we can start sending SQL statements to our MySQL server. <laughs> We're going to use the, uh, the methods from this connection that we created. Oh, and this, uh, this is just the default URL, by the way. We just have this URL uh, after installing SQL. It should, it should work for you. Um, so once MySQL is running, we can create statements and send those statements. Always use your prepared statements like we saw in 115. Prepare your statements when you have user generated strings that you're splicing in here. Always use your uh, prepared statements. Syntax is a little different than we saw in Python, but the idea is the same. The indices do start at one, but prepare your statement and then set the values using these set string set it. We have uh, strong typing here, so we have some extra 
hoops to jump through for that. But index one will replace this question mark, index two replaces this question mark. It just goes in order of the way the, 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 way the question marks appear in your statement. And then finally, statement.execute to send that to the SQL server that you're connected to. Just a quick reminder, make sure you're preparing your statements because people can destroy all your stuff and steal all your data. If we want to get data from the database, slightly different methods, slightly different syntax, we're going to use execute query, which returns a result set if we're expecting information returned back from MySQL. Once we have the result set, we can iterate over it using, um, uh, using its uh, next method. This method returns true if there's another value to be read and false otherwise. So we throw this in a while loop, access the values, and then do whatever we need to do with them after that. I'm, adding, I'm just adding them to a dictionary here, so then I can use all my just regular Scala stuff after that, and I don't have to think about a database once I have it in a regular data structure. SQL, I don't, I should have removed this slide. We talked about this stuff in 115. I don't really need to talk about what SQL itself is. Uh, but it's, it's similar to a CSV. It's rows and columns, similar to a spreadsheet as well. So how do we, if we want like a, a key value store or lists or something like that, it's hard, to, uh, it's hard to add that value in there. There are options, joins, using switching to MongoDB, et cetera. There, there are uh, uh, other things we can do. It's a little bit more than we want to do in 116. We just want, again, that idea of using a database and persistent storage and communicating with the database um, using TCP, using those networked protocol. For, for this class, for the clicker homework, we'll, in the rows, store JSON strings. It's a little bit of cheese, but it works. It'll get us through the clicker, where we'll just put a JSON string in the table so the value is a, a very structured um, piece of data. So we, we kind of, uh, it's not, it's not something you should do with SQL, and I didn't set it up last year that way, but uh, I don't want to get bo too bogged down on, uh, on setting up databases this time around. Okay, so the, the good news for, for many of you, uh, there's no automated testing for MySQL in this course. I'm not going to run MySQL uh, on uh, Autolab and have you communicate with the database like that. For objective three in the homework, we'll still test our database functions by creating a test database that implements the database trait that we saw earlier, but we'll use data structures to store all the data. So it won't be persistent storage, but it'll give us a way to test our databases. And that's something common that we see in programming. You don't always want to spit up the full app and every piece of your architecture to test this one little piece of functionality here. So we'll often create dummy classes to simulate in a very simple way some piece of the functionality, some piece of the architecture, and then use that for testing other pieces. So it's a common thing that I want you to be exposed to here. But the next lab, lab activity six. six. Lab activity six is going to be some MySQL, so make sure you have it installed, make sure you can run it, make sure you can connect to it and test it. Be ready before that lab in two weeks with MySQL because you will be asked to do some database stuff. And that's your question. All right. Uh, uh, see everyone Monday. Have a good weekend.